Our last talk of this session is going to be given by Aaron Johnson on behalf of his colleagues Rob Jansen, Nick Hopper, Aaron Siegel, and Paul, um, Paul Syverson. And he's going to be talking to us today about peer flow, secured load balancing, and TOR. Welcome, Aaron. Okay. Um, all right, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I believe all of the authors of this paper are here, so you could talk to any one of us five. Um, you should probably bump into us even if you don't want to talk to us about this. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the problem of secure load balancing in Tor. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to touch on, there were a lot of details, and we looked at a lot of different design options that I obviously don't have time to go over. So what I am going to talk about is um, what the problem is, why you should care about it, um, some existing solutions that exist and uh, why they don't fully set it, solve the problem, uh, and then a solution that we propose called peer flow, um, some of the security properties and how we evaluate its performance. Okay, so let me talk about the, uh, the problem. Um, so as we've been talking about in the last talk, um, Tor provides anonymous communication using roughly a system architecture of this. You have users, you have a network of relays, and users construct circuits through a sequence of those relays to get to the destinations. And there are these guards that users choose for the first hop always. I'll signify them with these little shields. And then there are exits that allow users to exit the network and go to a destination. I have a little exit sign for that. So this might make it look like the Tor relays are uniform, but as our last speaker was discussing, the relays are not uniform in terms of the resources that they provide to the network. And in particular, some of the re uh, relays have a lot of bandwidth, and some of the relays have relatively less bandwidth. Because the major function of a relay is to receive and send traffic, that's a major resource that you both want to take advantage of and don't want to limit yourself to the performance of the weakest members of your network. Moreover, Tor doesn't know what these are exactly because these are run by a bunch of volunteers. Um, the volunteers themselves might not know what they are um, or might not know how to report it. And in any case, we can't really trust them which I'll get into later. Um, but just to take advantage of these resources, clients need to know what the bandwidths are, um, and then they will choose them, or they should choose them in some relation to how much um, resources they provide. So like this, you probably didn't notice it, but the guy at the bottom switched his path from going through that bottom smaller relay to, the, um, to a middle relay that has a little bit more capacity once he knows that that's actually the case. However, as I was saying, if you just trust the relays to tell you how much their bandwidth is, it can allow an adversary to attack a lot of client traffic without expending a lot of resources. So, for example, if you're running on a consumer internet connection that maybe costs $50 a month, but you manage to convince the network that you're running on a 10 gigabit line at some tier one ISP, you might attract a lot of client traffic. And those tra clients try to connect to you. What can you do in that position? Well, if you're this red guard here, you can attempt to do, say, website fingerprinting, or to construct a list of Tor users to sell to somebody. Or maybe you can attract a lot of people to use you as an exit. And if you're in that position, you can see what people are visiting. And if they're using unencrypted, unauthenticated communications, you might be able to see or modify their traffic. And worst, if you're in both positions, you can use well-known timing correlation attacks to de-anonymize the user, that is to link the client with the destination that he's visiting. So this is a real threat. Um, this isn't uh, somebody might do this in the future kind of threat. This is a graph of the top Tor relay by advertised bandwidth. Tor relays do report what they think their bandwidth is. That's a big component of how the system currently works. Since 2012, and you can see at least a few very suspicious spikes here. They generally last less like a day. Um, and in at least one case, it was the case that somebody intentionally manipulated it. That case was a researcher, so he had no obvious or likely malicious intent. But there was somebody that knows about this and was using it to attract more client traffic. I'm not sure if we can explain all of this. Okay. <laughs> so that's the problem. And I think it's a pretty serious one for the security of the Tor network. 
Now, I'm not the pers person to recognize this, and other people have looked at this, including the Tor project itself, and there are a couple of existing solutions. In this paper, um, and I'll describe some of the results we have um, in this area, we demonstrate some attacks on these systems. So the first system, TorFlow, is a system that Tor designed for itself to do better load balancing. I would say it was primarily designed for performance reasons, to accurately measure how fast these relays are, with security as um, at best an afterthought. So let me describe the system. The flaws are fairly obvious. I mean, to anybody that understands it, it's fairly obvious what the problem is. <laughs> Including the Tor people, by the way. Oh, okay. All right, I'll try to keep it, think, think it, keep it low. Um, also, I should mention that we're not the first to recognize this or publish these particular issues, although we did independently implement them and turn this off, I think. Okay, hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, although we did independently implement them and measure them. So, okay, this is how TorFlow works. Uh, the relays are divided into 50 relay slices by what Tor currently thinks their capacity is perhaps based on a previous measurement. Then some bandwidth authorities, BWOFs, um, will choose two relays in a given slice and create a two-hop circuit, circuit um, and then download a test file and see how long it took. They divide them in these slices so that you're paired up with somebody that's similar bandwidth as you so that you're not limited by one of your partners. So then a relay is given a relative speed relative to its slice by averaging all the download speeds Sorry, relative to the entire network, it averages all the download speeds that it was a part of and divides them over the average of all the download speeds that anybody was ever a part of. And that gives you a relative speed. And then they multiply it by the number that you give them, your advertised bandwidth. So I should also say that this is my understanding of how the system worked when we submitted this paper, which is about a year ago now. Things may have changed. I don't know, but my understanding is uh, it still works like this. OK, so this is obviously um, not all that secure. Um, first, since you're multiplying by the self-reported bandwidth, uh, you can set it arbitrarily high and get whatever multiple you get measured as um, times that. I do have a cell phone on me. You think that's it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should have thought of that. <laughs> that's right. Okay, yeah. All right, so another issue is that um, you may be able to tell that you're being t measured. In fact, it's very easy to tell you're being measured in TorFlow because the bandwidth authorities are easy to figure out. They're well-known, they're hard-coded, actually. Um, and the files that are downloaded are also easy to figure out. So you can just then only send traffic when you're being tested and never ever send traffic anywhere else and make it really cheap for yourself. Um, also, uh, this is an easy fix, but I don't think that TorFlow actually validated that you were sending the traffic that it was, or sending the file that it wanted. So you, if you were with the entire circuit, you could just skip the download and save yourself half the cost. OK, so like I said, we weren't the first to recognize these are issues, but we implemented it just to give some basis for comparison for our own system. Um, we ran shadow experiments with an implementation of TorFlow, and we ran this attack. We ran one and two together, attacks one and two. And in our experiments, in the median, we were able to reduce the good put required, the actual data being transferred by the relay from 22.5, which gave away to 7, which is a meaningless number. It's just relative that matters. Um, uh, we reduced the required uh, good put by two orders of magnitude to 0.2 to get an even higher consensus in the median case. So the attack works, unsurprising. But it can give you potentially hundreds of times more consensus weight, more client traffic, than you're paying for in the sense that you're you know, providing somewhat expensive resource that is bandwidth. OK. So that system has issues. Uh, but there is another system that has been designed to solve this problem called Eigenspeed by Snyder and Borisov in 2009, um, although the fullest version would be in Snyder's thesis. Let me quickly describe the system. It's a bit more complicated. I, can't, I really can't describe it in detail. But I think I can give you the idea of how it works and um, how the flaws we discovered are fairly difficult to solve by maintaining true to this, this idea anyway. So in eigenspeed, the, re the relays measure each other. Instead of having a third party measure, you have a peer measurement system. Um, so the relays keep track in the recent past of how fast they observe traffic coming from one of their relays. And every so often, they send it to a bandwidth authority. That bandwidth authority collects those and then will periodically aggregate them to give estimates for what the capacities for all the relays are. So these pairwise measurements are in that matrix. And the way that it does this aggregation is 
uh, essentially takes the left eigenvector of this matrix. Why does that make sense? Because it's a matrix that's, or it's a, it's a vector that says, if I'm, you know, 10% of this vector, then if you gave me a 10% weight when we did a linear combination of all of our own individual measurements, we would, it would be self-consistent. You would give me back this vector. It also means that if I end up with a high weight, my individual observations have more of an influence on what that is. So if you control a large part of the network, your observations should influence what the weights are. If you're, most of the network is honest, then maybe the adversary can influence this output since that's affected too much. I think that's basically the idea. They also add a couple of additional security features because this doesn't quite work, uh, at least against the attack that they, that they described. One is they look for liars that during the computation, it, it, it behaves in a, in a weird way. It changes faster than it should normally. And then another is if the resulting set of weights is very different than what you measured, then they think you're lying and trying to pull something funny. In either case, you get kicked out of the network, basically. I mean, you get set into a set of a pool that are considered unevaluated. And there may be a giant pool of them, and they get a very small fraction of the weight. So you can get essentially kicked out of the network if, you can, if, if you're caught lying. So I should say that these were designed um, to solve this attack. This, what they call the fat pipe attack. In the fat pipe attack, the malicious relays there at the bottom in the red pretend that they're sending lots of, that they have very fast measurements between each other, but they don't actually want to spend a lot of resources to send fast to the everybody else, so they just have it be low. And so these are designed to solve that problem, which I, I'm not, uh, you know, it may well solve that problem. But there are other things that the adversary could do, and we designed a, show a couple of these that are pretty effective. I'll describe one of them, which we call a framing attack. So the setup here is you have malicious relays at the bottom, and they're sending average traffic to the two trusted relays. So there's a trusted set in eigenspeed that is used to initialize the computation. Um, and also, and, and some, any, any other non-targeted relays also just, they will actually send traffic at the average rate with them. They'll pretend to send it among themselves, but they don't actually have to. But some targeted relays, they will say, I didn't see them at all, or it was very, very slow. So this will trigger, in some cases, the first liar metric, which is it will cause this computation to change too quickly. Um, I'd have to explain exactly why this eigenvector, uh, how the eigenvector computation works, but just take my word for it that um, in many cases, very reliably, as long as you had enough relays, not even very large amount of bandwidth, you could cause them to be essentially kicked out of the network, and yourself not. So in specifically, um, with about 1,100 trusted relays out of 5,000, and only 2.83% of the bandwidth being malicious, and 558 malicious relays, they were able to kick out 559 of 5,000 relays. And then once you're out, they can proceed to kick out another set, and then kick out another set, because it takes a while to get back in, because you need to prove uh, that you are trustworthy in order to get out of this unmeasured set, which takes a while for security reasons. Okay, so there's another attack that actually doesn't just involve kicking somebody out, but it involves you getting more weight. Um, that sort of works with this one, but I'm not going to talk about that one. See the paper for that. Okay, so we took this idea of eigenspeed, but we weren't able to see how the eigenvector computation could be made to work. So instead, we aggregated things in a different way that we could reason about at least, and I think we didn't miss any obvious attacks. We have actually a proof. Um, in some sense, that is. I mean, in a, in a certain model, that it is secure. So let me tr d describe the, the basic idea in the last couple of minutes that I have. So in pure flow, there's a set of measuring relays that don't constitute the entire network, but they're like three-fourths of the network um, of the largest relays. And they will count how many bytes they exchange with all the other relays. So not speed anymore, which was always vague, but number of bytes, sent or received. Then. Um, when it's, it's observed long enough, and we describe what long enough is in the paper, um, they add some random noise to that number for privacy reasons. We use differentially private noise with a certain definition of privacy. And they divide it by their weight, their position weight, to give an estimate to extrapolate what they think that really that they're measuring sent across the entire network. So if they're 1% of the network, divide by 0.01 because they think they, you sent 99% of your stuff to everybody else, not, but you only saw 1% of it. And then you send these values, which here are denoted rho, to these bandwidth authorities. So then the bandwidth authorities get a bunch of estimates from measuring relays 
about what they think this measured relay sent across the entire network. And then there are two mechanisms that we use to cut out a, an adversary that doesn't already control a large part of the network but might be trying to manipulate this, maybe by making it seem very large or maybe by making it seem very small. The first thing that we do is we trim uh, the higher and lower fractions. Here the fractions are based on their current capacity. So if you already have a high weight, you have a higher vote, you could say, in the system. So if I'm 10% of the network, I get 10% of the vote in the system. If I'm 1% of the network, I'm 1% of the vote in the system. So if you're, an adversary is already small, he's likely to be trimmed out if he's trying to manipulate something. Separately, we include certain, um, a floor and a ceiling based on a set of trusted relays. They're denoted in the gold background, just as Eigenspeed had, that will limit a certain feedback process that otherwise could grow without bound. So we, we do require trusted relays to have security over time. Using this estimate, they, uh, the, the bandwidth authorities compare it to what they think you should have sent. If your peers that have similar weights sent half as much or twice as much, then they think you're, you're, you're not uh, sending actually the traffic that you should. This is to allow you to decrease your, your capacity. Um, and if, if they do that, then they give you, they enter pro a probation period, which gives you a chance to prove that you're actually fast enough, um, which I won't talk about. But, uh, and then also to get relays into the network, uh, there's a whole process that they have to go through that involves, that starts off with them being in the middle position. I'll just say that. Okay. So, like I said, um, I think we were able to reason pretty carefully about this. It, uh, it is the case that we can prove some kind of bound. If you have a certain amount of weight, your, your inferred capacity should be no more than some multiple greater than that, at least in a given round. There is a, a non-trivial multiple, however. And here are some of the attacks that you can do in the system. I'll just talk about a couple of them. One is you could, let's say I'm a guard, I could pretend that I'm actually talking to clients, but never actually talk to clients. Since there's nobody observing that, they can't actually tell that you're doing that. So then you could get it to multiple of two by doing that. Maybe observable, but we can't you know, show that in a model that, that somebody could tell that it's being done. Um, I'll just talk about one more here. The second one is you could only exchange traffic with measuring relays. So three-fourths of the tra tra uh, met, uh, network is measuring, only exchange traffic with them because they're the only ones that have a vote. Um, so that gives you another multiple. Um, but the, but the, these, mul these multipliers do combine, but there's a small number of them, and the ultimate multiplier is for reasonable parameters, um, here it's like 3.5 in the paper when you added everything it ends up being like 4.5. So the second graph shows how this proceeds over time. Because there can be this feedback where I increase my weight by a little bit, which gives me more of a vote, which causes, allows me to increase my weight a little bit more, and so on. Sometimes this just peters out. It doesn't, if you start small, you, you end up small. But sometimes it can get away from you unless we have these trusted limits, these, the ceiling and the floor. So this graph shows where that process ends up where the x is where you started, your actual, your actual relative capacity, and the y-axis is where you ended up after you inflated and inflated as long as you could, what is the biggest that you could get? So we include both the case where we do the system as described and do a simpler system where you just use the trusted relays and ignore everybody else, which would obviously be a lot simpler. And, so, and sometimes in the limiting case, that's where you end up, so maybe you should just start there, although you get there right away in the trusted only case. So there are non-trivial multipliers here. But at least we have a win here that, we're, that doesn't have, you know, as far as we can tell, any obvious flaw that allows somebody to say kick out every other member of the network like previous solutions have. Um, I would also mention that we did the performance experiments because the whole point of this thing is to make Tor perform well. If that doesn't work, then, then, then this, this can't be used. Um, we ran them in shadow uh, on a smaller network. Um, we ran them against Torflow and the ideal case, that is where we pretend the network knows what the actual band balance are. So you can see ideal does work better than ideal, uh, better than Torflow and Peerflow. Peerflow works slightly less uh, good in, uh, than Torflow in terms of how much traffic it pumps through the system, the total good put. But it's the, the, the x-axis doesn't go to zero, so it's actually relatively small, like a 5% difference. And then if you look at the speed of a given download for those that do complete, there's a slightly longer tail that we found um, for the 300 kilobyte downloads, um, but largely they're the same. Okay, so just to repeat, um, Tor needs a secure load balancing system. It doesn't have one, and I think it's a serious problem. We showed that the existing solutions um, have fairly serious attacks, and in my opinion, require a rethink. Uh, we presented a new system called PeerFlow based on peer measurements um, that has a proof of security um, and that has demonstrated performance similar to TorFlow. Thank you. <laughs>